talk a little bit about a contemporary topic. It's Labdafka. Would have been my choice, but people wanted to know about uh, abortion. We'll talk about abortion. Again, uh, <laughs> I trust and I pray that this should never be any, anything no gale uh, la for anybody. Uh, yeah, right, right, but uh, let, let's go over this. As, uh, just to give you, the, give you the legal background that I'm sure you've been following, uh, back in the 1970s, uh, the Supreme Court uh, issued an opinion that's known by the name Roe versus Wade. And in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court created a new constitutional right under American law that a woman has the absolute uh, koach, the absolute right to choose to terminate or keep a pregnancy. Uh, this was called the right to privacy. Uh, there is nothing in the US Constitution that says such a thing, but the Supreme Court kind of created it from a variety of inferences and the like. Now again, um, for anyone with legal training, this is an obvious point, but maybe it's not so obvious to you. When you say something is a constitutional right, that means the states do not have any power to regulate or prohibit it. It's a constitutional right, meaning it's not Stama legal right, it is a constitutional right, which means, in other words, uh, state governments would not have the authority to prohibit abortions at least until the last three months, the last trimester. What happened a few months ago uh, was that the Supreme Court finally overruled Roe versus Wade in a 5-4 decision, meaning four judges wanted to keep it. And Donald Trump gets 100% of the credit for this, or, or blame. Again, I'm not saying good or bad. I mean, I think it's good, but we'll talk about that. But this is absolutely because of Donald Trump, because Donald Trump appointed uh, three very conservative justices to the Supreme Court, and that made the majority that made, Ro made Roe versus Wade's overruling uh, possible. Had uh, Hillary Clinton won the election back in uh, 2016, this absolutely could not have possibly happened. Now, it's important to understand the following, and again, forgive me for spending a little time on the legal aspects of it. It allows me to relive my, my law professor days, another, another life, another Gilgal. Uh, and uh, that is that the Supreme, the Supreme Court did not forbid abortion. Please understand that. Overruling Roe versus Wade does not mean abortion is illegal. It means every state can now decide to regulate, prohibit, or permit. Okay, this is very, very important. A lot of people misunderstand this. Overruling Roe versus Wade simply means states have the freedom. Now, if you have a liberal state, like California or New York for the most part, this, uh, this decision has no effect on them at all. Uh, they matured abortion before and they'll matured abortion afterwards. Where it will make a difference is more conservative states which religiously and, and morally are against abortion. So as long as there was Roe versus Wade, they couldn't do anything about it. And now they're given the co-op to do something about it. Uh, people call those the red states or whatever it would be. So the question that uh, obviously we're not here to give a, a, a class on the legal aspects of abortion, uh, but the issue is what does Salah say about abortion? And is there a difference between the law that applies to non-Jews and the law that applies to Jews. Because that's an important point. When you say, what is the Jewish view of abortion, that actually uh, breaks down to two separate questions. What is the Jewish view of abortion for Jewish people? And what is the Jewish view of abortion for non-Jewish people? A little strange, right? Jews have a view of, Jews have an opinion on everything. We even have an opinion what the Goyim should do, right? And uh, that's going to be the, the question here. So let me start with the Goyim first. We know, of course, that the Jewish people are bound by the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. We also know that the non-Jewish world are not bound by the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. The Torah was only given to the Jewish people. A non-Jew does not have to keep Shabbos, perhaps should not even keep Shabbos. A non-Jew does not have to put on tefillin, right? The 613 are for us. But non-Jews also have chiyuvim towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And these chiyuvim are known as the seven mitzvahs b'nei Noach, the seven Noachite laws, uh, so-called because Noach was the founder of humanity after the flood. But in truth, the Gemara actually explains that the seven commandments were actually given all the way back to Adam HaRishon with one particular change. 
that one of the seven commandments of Noah is you're not allowed to eat a limb that is severed from an animal. That's called, while well, it's alive. That's called Avram and Achai. Now, Adam was not allowed to eat meat at all. So there was no Isser of Avram and Achai. Instead, there was an Isser to eat meat. In Noah's time, that got modified that you're allowed to eat meat, but you cannot eat a limb that is severed from an animal that's alive. But other than that, the mitzvahs b'nei Noach actually go back to Adam HaRishayn. Now, the seven commandments of Noach uh, overlap with the Ten Commandments, but they're not at all the same. I mean, there's overlap, but they are also very, very different. And if you Google Noahide laws, which most of the time is spelled as uh, N-O, like Noah, N-O-A-H-I-D-E, Noahide, you will actually see a lot of websites of righteous Gentiles who are not Jewish, but they want to keep the Noahide laws. So they're not Christian and they're not Muslim. They actually believe in, in God the same way that we believe in God, and they believe that the Jewish people have a written Torah and an oral Torah. They have all of the beliefs of Jewish people, but they understand that their job is to be righteous Gentiles. And uh, the Rambam writes, Chasidei umos haolam, righteous Gentiles who keep the Noahide laws properly have a share in the world to come just as Jews do. It's a very, very amazing thing. This is a unique aspect of Judaism because most religions, if not all, teach that the only way you can have eternal life and connection with God is by following their rules. Christianity sometimes tries to be nice about it, but the theology of Christianity is very clear. You don't believe in yashka, uh, you know, you have eternal damnation. Islam is the same thing. Judaism, on the other hand, says we don't proselytize. Judaism says you don't have to be a Jew in order to have eternal connection with Hashem. You do have to keep Hashem's laws, but for a non-Jew, there's an alternative way of keeping Hashem's laws, which is frankly, seemingly a bit easier, uh, 7 to 613, and that is the seven mitzvahs of Noah. So whenever we ask a question, what is the halacha about these types of issues, we actually ask, what is the halacha vis-a-vis -a, -vis a non Jew under the Noahide laws? And then we ask, what is the halacha vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Jew under the 613 commandments of the Torah? So interestingly enough, with respect to the Noahide code, we actually find a very, very severe rule. And that is, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, if a Ben Noach, if a non-Jew, Ben Noach just word for a non-Jew, if a non-Jew performs an abortion, uh, the non-Jew is guilty of murder. It is treated as a capital offense under the Noahide Code, which at a time when capital punishment was administered could actually carry the death penalty. And the way the Gemara infers it is from a verse when murder is described in the, under the Noahide Code after the flood. So the Torah says, Shofech dam ha'adam bi'adam. He who spills the blood of a person, now note the phrase here, adam bi'adam, so if you looked at the art scroll translation, it would mean he who spills the blood of a person through a person, meaning you hired a hitman. Your blood shall be spilled. But if you read it very literally, Adam be Adam is he who kills a person in a person. So the Talmud says, what is a person inside of a person? That would be a fetus. And the Torah says, now this is under the Noahide load, uh, code, the Torah says, Damo yishafech, his blood shall be spilled. Which means under the Noahide code, abortion is tantamount to murder and it is a capital offense. It is a capital crime. Now, that has some interesting implications. We know the halacha, and this applies to non-Jews as well, that if somebody is about to kill somebody, I am permitted and even commanded to kill the person who is about to kill somebody else, right? That is called the famous law of Rodef. That is why we can shoot a terrorist and the like. Now, it's important to keep in mind, the law of Rodef is not based on punishment. Once the terrorist has killed somebody, I'm not allowed to kill him. He has to be tried by a court. The purpose of the law of Rodef is not to punish bad people. The purpose of the law of Rodef is to prevent. In fact, a few years ago, there was a case in Israel involving a soldier. 
in which a terrorist had been knocked to the ground. And the way the video had it was, an Israeli soldier just went over to him, put a gun to his head and shot him. And the Israeli soldier was court-martialed and being tried for murder on the ground that once the terrorist finished his terrorism and he's no longer a danger, you're not allowed to kill him. He has to be tried by a basin, by a court, something. Now, the soldier's argument was that the guy was still crawling towards a weapon. So, so I, again, I can't take a position on this one way or the other. I don't know the Metsias. But in principle, uh, the army is correct, meaning once a terrorist has been immobilized and is no longer a Sakana, then you're dealing with punishment. You're not dealing with prevention. Once you're dealing with punishment, you normally need a base in or a court. That's another Shaila. Uh, it's not Shaila. Din of Raidef does not apply. Now, what has happened in the United States every once in a while is that we've had what are called pro-life people. These are usually Christian fundamentalists who are very, very anti-abortion. And uh, they uh, <coughs> wait in ambush in front of a hospital. And when the abortion doctor shows up and gets out of his car, they kill the abortion doctor. <coughs> and they claim that they're doing so to protect the lives of the innocent babies that are otherwise going to be aborted. Now, they're not using the halachic term, <coughs> but essentially their argument is that if life begins upon conception, then the same way I could kill somebody who's trying to kill uh, an innocent person, I could kill somebody who's trying to kill an innocent fetus. So the interesting question is, according to halacha, how would halacha assess that claim? Would halacha allow me, or a non-Jew, me or a non-Jew, to kill an abortion doctor who's about to perform an abortion based on the grounds that they're eroded. Now, let me point out, under American law, this never works because, I mean, I mean, now maybe it's interesting, but as long as Roe versus Wade was the law that abortion was a permitted procedure, then you can't kill the abortion doctor for doing what he's allowed to do. So these guys always went to jail. These guys were arrested. Uh, they went to jail. Sometimes the jury uh, would recommend a very lenient sentence, etc., depending on, on the like. But a vadit was a crime. So I don't want to get in trouble here, and uh, you know, don't circulate. Well, I guess Torah anytime sends it to the United States, but okay. Uh, <laughs> but the question would be la halacha, though. If indeed the abortion of a uh, the abortion performed by a non-Jew is considered to be a paula of ritzicha. Would that make the abortion doctor a rodef who you'd be allowed to kill? Keep that question in mind. Now, to make this even more complicated, even though abortion is a capital crime under the laws of Noah, abortion is not a capital crime under the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. Meaning to say, that if I, as a Jewish person, perform an abortion, I am not, we'll talk about why is it us or at all, but I'm not guilty of murder. Now, how do I know that? I mean, after all, if it says by B'nai Noach, Shofech dam ha'adam bi'adam, damo yishafech, then what would be the basis to be more lenient in the case of a Jew? So there are two sources that abortion is not a capital crime under the law of the Torah. Source one is a drasha from the Mechilta. The Mechilta is the halachic medrash of Chazal on the book of Shmos, where it says, Make uh, nefesh adam, if you smite, if you kill the soul of a person, your blood shall be spilled. Now that's not by the Noachite code, that's by uh, Yisrael code, by, by the Jewish law. And, and the Chazal have a in the Mechilta, nefesh means a fully born person and not an unborn person. Meaning killing an unborn person is not called killing a total nefesh. The nefesh is not yet independent from the mother. And therefore the Mechilta actually darshans. It is not a capital crime uh, for a, a Jew. Uh, a second makar is an interesting halacha in Parsha Shmos. There are many Gemaras and Bavakama about this. Let's say two guys are fighting, two men are fighting, and a pregnant woman uh, foolishly interposes herself between the guys to stop fighting. And uh, 
she gets a punch in the belly, and God forbid there is a miscarriage. So the Torah imposes financial liability. This is called the mevulades, that uh, the husband of the woman gets what are called compensation for the loss of fetal life. Now you know there's a general rule in halacha, I don't know if you, some of you might not have know this, that if I commit a single action which carries a death penalty and a financial obligation, the halacha is that the death penalty cancels out the financial obligation. An example would be if I shoot somebody uh, and I rip, as a result, uh, there's blood that splatters on uh, an expensive carpet or a Ming vase gets shattered uh, in the bullet. So since I'm high of Misa, I don't have to pay for the broken vase and I don't have to pay for cleaning the carpet. This is the famous rule, come lay bidrabamine, that the greater punishment of death cancels out financial responsibility. So here's the argument. If killing a fetus would be a capital crime of murder, then how could we obligate the perpetrator to pay money? The capital chiv misa would cancel out the monetary obligation. So if we see there is a monetary obligation, al korchach, you're forced to say that there is no chiv misa. So we now have a very curious dichotomy that seems to be counterintuitive. Oh, okay, let me, I mean, before I get, let me get to a second point. So it turns out that abortion under the Noahide Code is a capital crime. Abortion under Jewish law for Jews is not a capital crime. But the question is, so why is it usher at all? Meaning, if it's not murder, why is it usher? Okay? So there's a big, big machlokas among many Rishayim and Achrayim. What is the source of abortion being prohibited under Jewish law, given the fact that there is clearly no capital punishment for the killing of a fetus, even if it's nine months, even if it's fully uh, developed in the womb? So some opinions say it actually is murder. But there's a Gezeira Sarkosov that it doesn't carry the death penalty, meaning just because this type of murder does not carry the death penalty does not negate that essentially it is murder. So that's actually the simplest understanding. It is murder for which there's a Gezeira Sarkosov that there's no Chiyav Misa. That would mean, in other words, abortion under the Noahide Code is murder with capital punishment, Abortion under Jewish law is murder without capital punishment. That's one interpretation. Others say that the fetus is not considered a person. And killing the fetus under Jewish law is not murder. The law against abortion does not embrace the notion of life begins at conception. But the problem of the fetus is not that it is a person but it is a potential that can develop into a person in the course of nine months in birth. So the isser of abortion is not murder, but the frustration of a potential to life. In other words, in a more philosophical language, this would actually mean halacha rejects the notion of the fetus being a person. So the fetus per se does not have rights to live, but the Torah says that that which could develop into a person, it's not a right because it's not here yet. Uh, you don't, you're not machas. And, and the Chavos Yoyer says that this is a kal v'chomer from hashchas hasera. We know there's a prohibition of masturbation, of wasting, male seed, and what issue is that? That's certainly not a human life. It's, you're not murdering anything. But since the male seed would have the potential to generate life, you're not allowed to destroy that which potentially could become life. The Chavas Yoyer basically says the Isser of abortion is like Hashchas So these are two different ways of looking at it. 
Now, the problem with this is this. You then have a kind of an incoherence because the Noahide idea and the Torah idea do not seem to match up. For example, in the secular world, when people debate, uh, you know, people who are against abortion go by the name pro-life instead of anti-abortion. Right? Actually, there's, there's some genius in the marketing here because people like, you know, they like you if you're pro-something. They don't like you if you're anti-something. So uh, anti-abortion people invented the name pro-life. And what's even more brilliant is the pro-abortion people, pro-abortion, that doesn't sound right. Who is pro-abortion? So, I'm not pro-abortion, I'm pro-choice. Oh, I like choice. Choice is good. Again, the, the marketing is very, very, pro-choice is actually a very brilliant designation for people who are fundamentally pro-abortion. Pro, uh, pro Although I will say, uh, there's a great criticism of the pro-life movement because they're very anti-abortion, which, which is good by and large, but, but they don't like to help kids once they're born. They're against welfare, they're against helping families. So the joke about the pro-life movement, and see, it's a good joke, although I, I'm closer to pro-life, but the joke is pro-lifers believe that life begins at conception and ends at birth. Uh, meaning to say, everything is about that fetus. Once the kid is born, you know, who cares what happens to him at that, at that point. And, and I do want to say, I mean, I, and this is just as a side point that's very, very important. If you're going to have a society that stands up for the rights of the unborn and prohibits abortion, and which is, you know, which is good, I, I think, but, but you can't just let you know, mothers of unwanted pregnancies bear the burden without giving them the support system that they need. So if you want to be pro-life, then you got to be pro-life in the totality of pro-life, not just prohibit abortion, but you got to talk about the welfare and the financial resources, the psychological resources, the medical help uh, that people need to be able to either raise a child or to give a child up for adoption or whatever it would be. It's very, very irresponsible to throw somebody under the bus and say, you have to have this kid and we are not going to help you at all uh, when you go ahead and have it. So th that is an important point, meaning uh, there is an achrayas, I think a very solemn responsibility on states that are going to have tough abortion laws to create uh, safety nets and create systems that help women in need. Because the truth of the matter is, although economic despondency is not a justification for an abortion, but, but Lemaisa, people are in deep, deep, deep trouble, both financially and emotionally, and there would, be a, there, there would be a need for a responsibility to help them in that way. But okay, but here's the thing. It's commonly said that pro-life people believe life begins at conception. And pro-choice people say, life does not begin until the child is born. Now, if I were to ask you, according to Judaism, when does life begin? Does life begin at conception? Or does life begin at birth? Now, how are you even going to be able to answer that in a coherent way? What are you going to say? Well, uh, if it's a guy under the Noahide law, life begins at conception because killing a fetus is murder. But under Jewish law, life does not begin until birth because killing the fetus is not murder. That's a nonsensical answer, especially since, and I'll show you how even more nonsensical it is, the chiluk between Jew and Goy is not based on the identity of the baby, it's based on the identity of the person performing the abortion. <laughs> Meaning to say, if a non-Jew performs an abortion on a Jew or a non-Jewish person, he's chay of Misa. If a Jew performs an abortion, on a Jewish woman or a non-Jewish woman, he's not Chayamisa. Now, it's the same baby. So what are you telling me? If a guy is the abortion doctor, life begins at conception. If a Jew is an abortion doctor, life doesn't begin at birth. See, that doesn't make sense. So, I mean, you can't have a, a differential definition on the same baby, depending on the identity of the wrongdoer. So, in a way, uh, the, the typical binary description of does life begin at conception or does life begin at birth is an incoherent 
uh, application to this rule. So the only two ways you have to describe it is there are two ways you can learn. If you learn like the opinion that even for Jews, abortion is murder, then we basically would say life begins at conception, both under the Noahide Code and under Jewish law, but for whatever reason, and even then I don't, we have to have a good reason, Jewish law does not impose capital punishment for that murder, but it is murder on both sides of it. Right? So that's one way of looking at it. Or if you follow the Chavas Yoyer, we look at the other way. Life does not begin upon, uh, life does not begin until birth, and that is why it is not murder under Jewish law, but under the Noahide law, there is a stringency that even the frustration of potential life is included in murder. But not that it is a murder, but it's an extension of murder. Okay, again, you think about this, you'll, you'll see the, the great difficulty in pigeonholing uh, this, this dichotomy. Now, you may still ask me a general question. Why, sh whatever the reason is, whatever the lumbus is, whatever the svara is, why on earth should the law be stricter for non-Jews than it would be for Jews? Right? That's very strange. Jewish law is normally stricter than non-Jewish law. Why is this stricter for non-Jews? Truth is, we really don't know. A lot of this is based on psukim. But one reason might be kind of a prophylactic idea, and that is abortion was so common in the ancient world, but the Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, etc., that when God wanted to stamp out the process, he had to create a more rigorous, stricter punishment structure, which was less necessary for Kuali Israel. Meaning to say, the Umota Olam were Meshuka, as they are today, as a matter of fact, in this particular Avera, and therefore the punishment had to be much greater. Okay. Be it as it may, this is the dichotomy between pro-life and pro-choice. Now, uh, I'm sorry, between, uh, I'm sorry, between Noahide law and, uh, and the law of the Torah that applies to a Jewish person. Now, common denominator, though, is that abortion is prohibited both for Jews and non-Jews, although for different reasons, possibly. Common denominator. So the question then becomes, are there circumstances where abortion will be permitted. So we have one Mishnah, a Mishnah in Maseches Oalos, uh, which clearly tells us that if the mother's life is in danger, meaning if there's a risk that she will die if the baby is brought to term and born, she will die, even if it's only a risk. So the halacha is abortion is permitted b'makayim pikuach nefesh of the mother. Uh, and our assumption is this would apply to the Noahide code as well, although there's some discussion about that. Now, there are a number of questions about this. Uh, when we say abortion is permitted, is abortion permitted or is abortion required? What if the mother would say, for example, she would prefer to have the baby and die I mean, I'll give you an actual example. Uh, these were cases where a pregnant woman was in advanced cancer. And uh, at most, it was thought she only had a few months to live. But with the stress on her body of giving birth to a child, she would die right away. So she might say, this might be a reasonable decision. I would rather have the child and die in childbirth, then abort the child and live for another six months. That, in terms of pure logic, that actually is a logical decision. Because if the woman is going to die anyway, but giving birth will accelerate her death, but if she gives birth, she'll have a child that will survive her. So that's a big machlokas. When we say abortion is permitted for the pikuach nefesh of the mother, can the mother herself waive that in the interest of having a child? Now, if you say she can, I'm going to get and give you another question, a question on top of that question. Im tim salomar. She can? Could the husband make such a decision 
if the wife is incapacitated. Example, the woman is unconscious. She is on life support. She is in a coma. She happens to be pregnant. Uh, it is probable because of cancer or whatever the condition that if she gives birth, she will die in that process. Now, I had mentioned if she would be awake, there's a machlokas, could she make the decision to give up her life for her child? But even if we assume she could make the decision, would the husband have the right to make that decision? Would the husband have the right to say, uh, you know, uh, I want to have the baby, <laughs> so to speak. That's what my wife would have wanted. Very difficult questions. These are very, very difficult questions because essentially the husband is making a decision to condemn his wife to death by allowing the birth to go ahead. And you see, this is so tragic because uh, what's going to happen is she gives birth and she dies. Uh, the, other, the other side is do the abortion so there's no baby and she'll die a few months later anyway. There's no happy solution. But that's one issue of pikuach nefesh to keep in mind. A second issue of pikuach nefesh is the very important idea, I'm just giving you kind of a, an outline here, that psychological stress is very much a component of pikuach nefesh because people who can have mental breakdowns can very easily be suicidal and they can harm themselves or harm others. Now, this is how Halacha would view rape or incest. You sometimes hear pro-lifers say, I am against abortion, except in cases of rape or incest. Now, in some ways, that's an incoherent position. Because if you take the view that life begins Upon conception, I mean, could you kill a born baby? If a ba let's assume a baby was born as a result of rape or incest. Would a woman be allowed to say, it's so traumatic for me to have a baby coming from rape or incest, I want to kill the baby? Nobody would allow that. You wouldn't be allowed to kill a baby because of the trauma of rape or incest. So how are you allowed to do it if it's an abortion, if you're equating that with a born baby? So because of this, the way halacha approaches rape or incest is not by creating a rape or incest exception, but by recognizing a pikuach nefesh exception. Meaning, if the circumstances are so traumatic that they are potentially life-threatening, and that depends on every individual case, then abortion is permitted not because of rape or incest, but because of pikuach nefesh, and that depends on the person. They tell a story, I, I have no idea if the story is true, I, I, I'm not vouching for its accuracy, that there was a religious uh, teenager years ago who was raped, uh, and a single, you know, she was single, uh, and she got pregnant, and uh, she was carrying twins. And uh, the rapist was black, I'm only mentioning it because It'll come out the way the children would be born. Now, you can imagine, maybe you can't imagine, how traumatizing uh, this would be for any girl, any girl, and for a religious girl, you know, many, many more levels. And uh, the woman, the young lady, was so distraught that she actually was on the verge of suicide. And uh, her parents arranged a meeting with Rav Moshe Feinstein to discuss what her options are, what her choices are. And uh, you'll either like this or you'll hate this. Uh, Ramosha spoke to her for three or four hours. And Ramosha told her words that it may be very hard for us to grasp. And Ramosha said, you know that the babies that you're carrying are Jewish babies because you're a Jewish woman. And these are Jewish children. And Ramosha says, I, I don't know why this happened to you, and how such a tragedy, and why these neshamos came into the world in such an awful way. But you're able to raise them to be tzaddikim, to be talmidei chachamim, to sanctify God's name. And he spoke to her for a number of hours, and she was placated, 
and she was calmed down. And she resolved to have the babies and raise them. I don't know the whole story. I don't, I don't even know if the story is true, but the, but the story goes that she raised the, the these were twins. Uh, they they were you know black. They had uh, African American features, and the story goes that uh, they became uh, both Talmidei Chachamim, twin brothers. They became Talmidei Chachamim and Rabbanim, and they married. And they have families, and in spite of this awful origin of how they came into the world. They became very, very fine Jews, and they brought nachas to their mother. Very, very strange. In the Gemara itself, by the way, in the Gemara itself, uh, there's the story about the daughter of Shmuel. Daughter of Shmuel was uh, taken uh, captive by a goy who apparently, you know, raped her and had a child. She had a child from that goy. But, you know, you can never underestimate a good woman. Uh, this guy that raped her converted, became a religious Jew, Isser Giora, as mentioned more a few times, and uh, the son is Rav Mari, who is called the son of Shmuel's daughter. Why is he called the son of Shmuel's daughter? Because a guy that has a child from a Jewish woman is halachic, not a guy, a guy has a child from a Jewish woman is not halachically the father. <laughs> so, so quite literally, uh, you, you have what, this story about Rav Moshe seems to be the story of Isser Giora in the Gemara itself. But when push comes to shove, I do want to emphasize, if indeed a person is so distraught, so devastated, so broken, that there really is a life-threatening situation, Halacha recognizes pikuach nefesh on a psychological dimension. Okay, that's the pikuach nefesh thing. Now, the final prat of pikuach nefesh that's so interesting is it doesn't make sense. Why are you allowed to kill the baby in order to save the mother? We know that most of the Torah can always be violated to save a life. That's not even violation. I violate Shabbos to save a life. I violate Kashras. I violate Yom Kippur. I remember in my own show, it was interesting that, um, unfortunately, the, the elderly father of one of the congregants who was visiting uh, uh, his daughter for Pesach collapsed in the middle of davening. He was an elderly man. He collapsed. I think he was dehydrated. So it was Shabbos. Uh, I went to the phone to dial 911, and I, I left the door open so people should see that I was dialing 911 because it was Bikuach Nefesh. And I still remember this um, five-year-old kid walked by and said, hey, the rabbi's on the phone on Shabbos. You know. With a brech that he noticed it. Uh, and thank God uh, the person was only dehydrated, so he actually was okay. But that didn't mean I did an Avera. I mean, if it looks like Bikuach Nefesh, you're mechoyev to do what you have to do, right? So we know Bikuach Nefesh is very, very important, obviously. But we also know that you cannot allow murder, right? If I go over to you, if a guy goes over to me and says, kill him or I'll kill you, I can kill the guy that's threatening me because he's a rodent, but I cannot kill an innocent person to save my life, right? Because as the Gemara says, who says my life is better than his life? But my pikuach nefesh allows me to kill him? The Torah says, my pikuach nefesh is greater than Shabbos. It's greater than Kashras. It's greater than Yom Kippur. That's a hierarchy. Preservation of life is greater than all of those commandments. But you logically cannot say preservation of life is greater than the issue of murder because when you're murdering, you're taking a life. So it's a Dover Pashat. This is my chazis. Who says your blood is any redder? For some reason, they always translate it sweeter, but the, but the word is redder. Sumka is red, not sweet. So here's the question. If this baby is born, mom is going to die. So the Mishnah says in Oalos, I can kill the, the unborn baby to save the mother. Why? Uh, you can't kill one person to save another person. Why is there a hetero pikuach nefesh bichlal? So fascinatingly, there's an interesting machlokas 
Rashi and the Rambam why pikuach nefesh of the mother allows the termination of a pregnancy. And this ties into our earlier discussion. Rashi says, because the fetus is not really a life, the fetus is a potential that can become a life when it's born. And even though as a potential you try to protect it, an actual life has priority over a potentiality. In Rashi's language, the unborn fetus is not a nefesh gomor. That's how Rashi understands it. It's only a potential. So yes, I can't kill one nefesh gomor in order to save another nefesh gomor, but I can frustrate a potentiality from developing in order to save an actual life in being. Yeah. So how serious uh, is the risk to life must be the risk to life in order for considered already a case of... Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, for example, if there's a one in a million chance that the woman might die, that would not be a justification. Uh, generally speaking, it's around a 10%, we say. 10, 10% or more is enough already to justify termination. Now, let me... Uh, yeah. Is conception and There seems to be no in between. I, there, there are some opinions that talk about uh, the, the uh, third trimester, meaning after two trimesters in which the body is, is, is developed. Uh, there is one view that therefore is, is, uh, makes that difference, but generally speaking, it's either conception or birth, and we don't really look at intermediate categories. Now, let me just mention the Rambam. The Rambam apparently rejects Rashi, and the Rambam apparently does treat the fetus as a person. And the Rambam has a very interesting uh, concept here. It's based on a Gemara. The Rambam says, the reason why I can kill the fetus to save the mother is because since the fetus is the source of why the mother's life is in danger, the fetus has the halacha of a rodef. Now this is pretty amazing. When we think of rodef, we think of bad people, we think of terrorists, we think of criminals, we think of guys with submachine guns. We don't think of unborn babies <laughs> as Rodef. But the truth of the matter is, the Gemara does give an example of a Katan being a Rodef. I mean, let's, ima let's imagine, for example, uh, and this can happen, that uh, you have a gun at home and it's loaded. This should never happen, but your three-year-old finds the gun and walks into a crowded Shabbos dining room brandishing the gun. Now obviously, you try to take the gun away in a safe way, etc. But I hate to say this, uh, if the only way to prevent people from being hurt is by killing the katan, you halakhically would be allowed to kill the katan because one can be a rodev even without malevolent intent. They give another example from the Holocaust uh, in which uh, a bunch of Jews were hiding in a bunker and the Nazis were searching the area for Jews. If they found the Jews, they would kill them all. And a mother and a baby, the baby starts crying. Now the story as they tell it, and this I think is a true story, is that the mother put a blanket over the baby's mouth just to muzzle the cry and unfortunately the baby suffocated. And that I think actually is a true story and again, very, very tragic. But I'm gonna say something that's even more tragic. And that is, according to Halacha, it is possible, I'm not giving you a psak, it is possible that the uh, nine people could kill the baby. Because if the baby's cries are creating the endangerment from the Nazis, the baby now becomes the rodef. The rodef is the one is the source of the endangerment. So we do have examples that non-malevolent actors can be rodefim. So the Rambam is machadish. Again, it's really based on a Gemara. That the heter of abortion, when the mother's life is in danger, is because the fetus is a rodef. So according to Rashi, the heter of abortion is because the fetus is not a complete life. 
According to the Rambam, the heter of abortion is the fetus might be a life, but it becomes a rodef that can be terminated. There are nafkaminas. There are actually differences in this approach. Uh, we, we don't have time to go into it. Maybe I'll do a part two to, to elaborate on this uh, next time. But this is an important machlokas to be aware of. So now, just uh, in the last few minutes, let me just address a final question. So, as an Orthodox person, uh, am I happy that Roe versus Wade was repealed, or am I unhappy? Meaning to say, is Roe versus Wade better, or is not having Roe versus Wade better? So here is an interesting argument. Under Roe versus Wade, abortions were virtually totally legal in the United States, and maybe until the last three months where there could be some regulation. But for the first six months, there was fundamentally no regulation at all, or no restriction at all, rather, on the legality of abortion. In that situation, millions and millions and millions of pregnancies have been terminated over the past 40, 45 years. Lives that should not have been terminated, uh, whether you call it murder or frustration of potential. So in, in a sense, the repeal of Roe versus Wade will reduce abortions, not eliminate them. And you might say that's a good thing because if the Torah is against abortion, both for Jews and non-Jews, laws that reduce abortion is bringing society closer to that which the Torah envisions. So Pashat Pshat would be, Baruch Hashem, we got rid of Roe versus Wade. See, if it just would have been a Jewish thing, then you know, we, who gives us the right to impose things on non-Jews? But once it becomes part of the Noahide code, then Fakert, any legal system that brings us closer to fulfilling the Noahide code would be good. That's one side of the question. But there's another side of the question, and, and, and that is this. From the perspective of a religious Jew, right? Ruvain and Sarah are a religious husband and wife. Under Roe versus Wade, in which abortion was absolutely legal, then if they had a shaila of pikuach nefesh, or would an abortion be justified, the only thing they had to consult was their doctor and their posik. The government had no input into that decision, and therefore the government could not inhibit their religious freedom. By contrast, once you get rid of Roe versus Wade, let's assume you have a law in like Louisiana, abortion is only permitted if the mother's life is in danger. But the decision is the mother's life in danger is now not only going to be a decision of a doctor and a posik, it now becomes the decision of the state's attorney for New Orleans, which means theoretically a Rav might paskin that psychological stress is pikuach nefesh, and the secular authorities might not agree. So the interesting paradox is from Jews, in terms of themselves, actually do better with Roe versus Wade than without Roe versus Wade because Roe versus Wade leaves me the unfettered choice to follow halacha with no repercussions. So my life, no, our life with our spouses is marginally better with Roe versus Wade than without. On the other hand, in terms of society as a whole, the repeal of Roe versus Wade is better because it brings society in closer attunement with the morality of, of, of halacha. So that's something you think about. There actually could be a debate in which a person might be philosophically and religiously pro-life, but politically would be in favor of a pro-choice position in not get, getting the government involved in that type of decision making. These are you know things to, to think about. Um, yeah. Where do you draw the line between having the government make a decision on uh, cases that involve murder and abortion? Meaning if we're saying that it's better that the government stay out of abortion so that he Right, to let them stay out of murder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Why not? Yeah, that's a very good question. Meaning uh, even a libertarian who is against uh, the government uh, doing a lot of things, 
The one exception they always make is for crimes or violence and the like, there you need a government uh, to step in. It's a very excellent question, because if one took the position abortion is murder, then why should I, allow, why should I be in favor of a hands-off attitude in the part of the government? It's a strong argument, uh, but I think the counter-argument might be that when you have uh, an issue in which society itself is very sharply divided, in which, rightly or wrongly, there is no consensus, then sometimes we're better served by the government not getting involved and giving people the freedom to make certain decisions, as opposed to murder in which everybody, every normal person, agrees that murder is wrong. Meaning, I think there's a difference between issues in which there is consensus and issues in which there's not consensus. But, you know, it's a good, it's a, it, is, it is a very good, it is a very good point. So, to put it in a, maybe a crude way, a crass way, uh, Roe versus Wade is better for the from Jews, and the repeal of Roe versus Wade is better for non from Jews and Goyim. So, uh, therefore, uh, from people do better with Roe versus Wade, society does better, religious, religiously, that is, if you get rid of Roe versus Wade, because that will restrict abortion. But again, I don't want to be callous about this because uh, you, know, you can't just talk about, oh, abortion is bad, we've got to stop abortions. I mean, there are women who are suffering, uh, single mothers, uh, poverty-stricken under tremendous emotional strain. If you are, go again, I'm just repeating, if you are going to prohibit abortion, you have to give mothers the resources that they need to either be able to raise the children or to put them up for adoption. You cannot just, like this is a general rule in Chinuch, even with their own children. You don't forbid something unless you give people the resources to be able to deal with it. You can't just say, usser, 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 usser. That's true for Chinuch, and that's true for an issue like, like abortion as well. So I think next week I'll be mamshich this because I want to discuss um, a very interesting medical technology. Many of you might, might have heard of um, stem cell research. And uh, I want to discuss the application of abortion law to the retrieval of stem cells. Uh, because stem cells uh, doesn't do involve destroying an embryo. And the mayor, the question is, are the destruction of embryos within the abortion laws, according to halacha, right? So uh, can there be stem cell research? Or another aspect of this is pre-implantation genetic screening where people who go through an in vitro fertilization and have embryos. The embryos can be examined under the microscope for genetic defects like Tay-Sachs or like Down syndrome. And uh, in the secular world, uh, if they have these defects, they will not be implanted, right? This is called pre-implantation, right? Before it goes into the mother's body, pre-implantation genetic screening, PGS is the Rosh Teva. And the question becomes, does that involve abortion? So what's interesting about this is that abortion does not only come up when you're trying to terminate a pregnancy. Abortion issues come up when you're trying to have a child. <laughs> you have a husband and wife who want to have children through in vitro fertilization, and yet there can be abortion issues in terms of pre-implantation genetic screening and in terms of using spare embryos, spare embryos for stem cell research. So we'll, we'll maybe talk about that uh, next week. Take care. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead.